a reading from Revelation chapter 19, starting at verse 6. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. At this, I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. And now I'm going to pray for Dan as he brings God's word to us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that it is you we worship. Father, I pray that you will guide Dan as he speaks to us now and um, brings what you have to say to us. Father, I pray that you would bless him and bless all who hear his words. Thank you, Lord, for your servant, Dan. Amen. <clears throat> Well, hello, everyone. It's uh, good to be with you today. Um, I hope you're enjoying the summer, uh, the summer holidays, maybe. Um, and it's great that we can be together today as we look at celebrating uh, the future together in Revelation uh, chapter 19, verses 6 to 10, uh, in case you missed it. We face an uncertain future. For almost all of us, we have never experienced such a time as these last 18 months, where we've not been sure of what's coming next. Even, that, even though there are now no more rules to follow, I'm sure many of us still feel unsure how, of how much we should be doing, particularly with the numbers still being so high. We hope we're out of the worst of it, but we're not sure, and it's been almost impossible to plan for the future. But there's also other things we're unsure about. We're not sure how well the economy is going to bounce back. And for some of us here, there may be uncertainty around jobs. But it's not just COVID-related uncertainty. We're not sure how the planet is going to fare given the damage we've done. We're not sure how the world will look with the rise of the Taliban again in Afghanistan. Many of us see the moral confusion in our country, and we worry for future generations and how it will affect them. Will they still have the freedom to follow God? Or you might be going through a difficult time personally at the moment, and you don't know what the future holds. Or maybe you're helping someone through who's going through something like that. Well, the early church at the time the book of Revelation was written would have been to, able to identify with us in some ways as, the, as they were facing an uncertain future. They were going through some tough times. It had only been a couple of decades since Jesus had risen from the dead and returned to heaven. And in that time, the church had grown at an incredible rate. But alongside that, they were facing increased persecution. They were faced being whipped, imprisoned, beaten, put into exile for their faith. Some were even facing death. And they were also facing false teaching and immorality seeping into the church through those who would do it harm. Even the apostle John, who wrote this book, was facing an uncertain future. By now, he's an old man, and he is in exile on the small Greek island of Patmos for sharing the good news that Jesus is alive. But while he is there, he has a vision of the future, the end of this world and the beginning of the next. And so as we continue our series looking at feasts, festivals, and family, as we look at the resources God has given us to sustain us and build his church, 
what has Jesus given us? What does he point the Apostle John and the early church to? And we, what does he point us to if we're facing an uncertain future? Well, he points to an event that is both a feast and a festival. He points to a wedding here in Revelation 19. God loves a wedding. All throughout the Bible, he uses the language of marriages and weddings with his people. When Jesus comes to earth, he continues that theme, referring to brides and bridegrooms and weddings in many of his parables and pictures. He even performed his first miracle at a wedding in Cana. And so there's a special imagery that a wedding gives us that God wants to speak to us through today as we look at the biggest wedding ever at the end of time here in Revelation 19. So whoever you are, whether you're married, single, young, or old, God wants to use the picture of a wedding to bless and encourage us today. So I wonder what your favorite part of a wedding is. You know, is it the uh, ceremony? Is it the vows that people give? Uh, Maybe it's the food, uh, which you're always really hungry for, because weddings are a really weird time, and they start at lunch, so you're really hungry by the time you eat. Maybe it's the awkward first dance, or the very strange ceremony of cutting the cake. A few weeks ago, I had uh, the honor of being best man at my brother's wedding, and so it was my job to make sure uh, that they got married and that they had everything that was needed for a wedding. And so that's the lens that we're going to look at this passage through today. What are the essentials you need for a wedding to happen? Well, as you see, you really only need a few things. All you need is a groom, a bride, and you need guests. It's very simple. You can tell I was obviously a brilliant best man. But before we look at these things individually, we need to understand some of the imagery being used here in Revelation because it's using lots of wonderful picture language. So who are the actors in this great love story? Well, firstly, the bride. Throughout the whole Bible, God's people are referred to as his bride. In the Old Testament, that's specifically the people of Israel. But when we get to the New Testament, the the Old Testament is fully realized, and it is the church, the whole of the church, the Jews and the Gentiles, you and me making up the bride. So the church is the bride in this story, which of course makes the groom Jesus. All throughout his earthly uh, time on earth, Jesus refers to himself as the bridegroom, the loving husband-to-be who is awaiting his bride. And so that is who we're going to look at first, the groom. The groom wants to look his best on his wedding day. Um, I got married nearly uh, four years ago now, and I can safely say that I have never put as much effort into the way I looked than on my wedding day. Of course, there are lots of photos and people looking at you, but most of all, you want to look your best for your bride. So what does Jesus, the groom, look like at this great and final wedding? Well, in Revelation 19, verse 7, it says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come. This is the last book of the Bible, when Jesus shall triumphantly return and righteously judge everything. And it's being written to a people who are uncertain about the future. And so you might expect Jesus to be referred to as the Lion of Judah, or the King of Kings, or the Captain of Armies. Surely that would be of more encouragement to Christians who are facing an uncertain future. And although some of those terms are used throughout Revelation, instead, overwhelmingly, John uses the image of a lamb to describe Jesus in Revelation. So why? Why does the groom look like a lamb in this picture language? Well, on his time on earth, Jesus was known by many titles, Messiah, Son of Man, Son of God. But as he begins his earthly ministry, John the Baptist, who Jesus refers to as his best man, says when he sees Jesus, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. 
When Jesus is at his most glorious, as he judges the world and makes all things new at the end of time, he primarily wants to be seen and known as the sacrificial lamb who takes away the sins of the world. A wedding is supposed to point us to love and sacrifice, but often in our culture that is sadly not the case. Whether it's in the context of a a marriage relationship or maybe a friendship or any relationship, we don't ask, what could I sacrifice for somebody, but what can I get from them? So we only stay in those relationships for as long as they serve us. And if that was Jesus' attitude, our future would be certain, but it would certainly not be good. In fact, it would be quite the opposite of good. In this unequal relationship, we bring all our baggage. We are far from the perfect bride. Our unfaithfulness, our failings, and our sin, and the chasm that our sin causes between these two lovers, Jesus and his people, is vast. It is almost insurmountable. There would be no wedding without the sacrifice of the Lamb. We would be left destitute with nothing in utter darkness. But Jesus was all about sacrifice. We were reminded that through our Bible overview series again and again. As Abraham is about to sacrifice Isaac, a ram is provided as a sacrifice pointing to Jesus. As the angel of death sweeps over Egypt in the time of Moses, the Israelites had to uh, paint the blood of a lamb on their doorposts so that death would pass over them. Jesus sacrificed by leaving the Father in heaven and coming to us as a helpless baby. And a few weeks ago, we looked at communion and how Jesus was the Passover lamb for us. The reason Jesus appears as a lamb at this wedding feast in eternity is to celebrate how we get to be at that feast. Long before Revelation, the prophet Isaiah writes about this same wedding feast. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich foods for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove from his people disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. What a day that will be. As Jesus humbly and meekly went to the cross, he went as a sacrifice for us. And by doing so, he removed our disgrace from the earth. He destroyed death, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. As human beings, uh, we don't live out marriage perfectly. And so this might be a difficult picture for some of us, because some of us may have been part of marriages that have broken down and caused hurt to us and hurt to others. And Jesus knows your pain. But this union is not based on earthly promises which can fail. It is based on eternal sacrifice already paid. And so on that final day after the judgment of all things, as we sit down at the wedding feast and we celebrate Jesus' great love love for his people, it is very fitting that Jesus is pictured as a lamb because that is when he demonstrated his love for us at the cross. Romans 5 says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So whatever we face in this life, and whatever you might be going through at the moment, we have a sure and certain future because the sacrifice of Jesus at the cross will last for all eternity. A future with our beloved. And that's the picture we see through a wedding. What God has joined together, let no one separate. And that is something that is worth having a feast and a festival about. So weddings are feasts that remind us of the sacrifice of Jesus, but they also remind us that we too are called to sacrifice. We are all called to put 
others before ourselves, and by doing so, pointing to the fact that amazingly, God put us first. So who can you sacrifice for? Who can you put first when it'd be easier to put yourself first? It may be your husband or your wife, but it may be your parents, your children, your friends, your colleagues. It's not easy to put someone else before us. In fact, it's really hard and counter-cultural. And we need the power of the Lamb to put others first, to be able to sacrifice. But we have the freedom to sacrifice and put others first because our future is secure. It cannot be shaken thanks to our bridegroom. So that's uh, the groom. But what about the bride? Everyone knows that a bride's wedding dress is one of the most important parts of a wedding. I remember uh, if I ever came back to my parents' home after a wedding I'd attended, one of my mum's first questions was, what was the wedding dress like? And a lot of the time I actually couldn't describe it in great detail, but I was always sure of one thing, it was white. Although actually I have learned since there are actually a lot of different shades of white, so I was probably wrong even then. But what you wear at a wedding is important. And most of all, it's important for the bride and groom who are looking at their best. And here in Revelation, it's no different, as we've already seen the lamb. But the clothes of the church, the clothes that the church wears for this wedding are important. And they're described for us in verse 7 and 8. For the wedding of the lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. The picture we have here is of a radiant bride, spotless and pure. This is the church, God's people. And this dress that she's wearing represents her righteousness, her goodness and purity before God. She is the perfect match for her radiant groom. This is you and me. And yet perhaps this isn't the church that you see around us. The church perhaps often seems a messy and broken place. Holland Road is a place of broken people like you and me. And we might look at the church and say, I don't see a beautiful bride, and I certainly don't see myself as spotless, as the spotless, pure bride of Christ. How could Jesus' vision of me be so far off? Doesn't the Bible say that even my good deeds, my righteousness is like filthy rags? How can I be considered pure and clean before God? And this is really serious. This is a a question of life and eternal death. In the Gospels, Jesus tells a parable of a a king who is throwing a wedding uh, wedding feast for his son, and it mirrors this passage. But there's a guest that is there, and they don't have a wedding garment, and they are thrown out into utter darkness. So what about our garments, our righteousness and purity? How can we be sure of our future and our place at this wedding? Well, it's about where your righteousness is from. When Becca and I were preparing uh, to get married, Becca, like all brides, needed to find her wedding dress. I wasn't involved in the process, but I hear there were many dresses tried on. And of all the dresses she tried on, there was one that stood out as just being the one, a cut above the rest. But there was a problem. It turns out that wedding dresses can actually be really expensive, and basically we couldn't afford this dress. But Becca's father came along, and in his generosity, he bought the dress for us outright. We didn't have to pay anything. He paid the price so Becca could be clothed with this wonderful wedding dress, and she looked beautiful. And it's the same with our robes for this wedding. We could never afford these robes of righteousness. We could never be pure and spotless before God through our own power and righteousness and goodness. But those righteous robes have been offered to us, given to us so we can wear them. There are famous verses that are often read at weddings from Ephesians 5. 
Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Not only has Jesus sacrificed for us so that our sins are forgiven. He's done more than that. He has also given us his righteousness, his purity. When two people come together, everything they have becomes shared. So for us, as we marry Jesus, that means Christ takes on our debts and pays them, and he gives us his righteousness. And so when Jesus looks at us, his vision is perfect as he sees us clothed in his righteousness. And if you're unsure today about how God sees you, then this is so important. A few years ago, Becca and I went through a real patch of a lot of weddings. We were at the age when a lot of our friends were getting married. Becca was working with students, and they were getting married when they were graduating. And there was one year that we were invited to 12 weddings. We didn't manage to get to all of them, but we got to a fair few of them. And there were some similarities between them. We heard that great passage about love in 1 Corinthians 13 a fair few times. But my favorite moment in pretty much all of them is that moment that the music starts and everyone stands and the bride starts to come in and the groom turns to see his bride and he is overjoyed. We were at a wedding on Friday and when, the, when this moment happened, the, the groom just started to, to, to tear up. It was wonderful to see. The moment has come. His bride is here and his face just lights up at seeing her, and it's a precious moment to witness. When Jesus looks at you, when he looks at Holland Road, when he looks at the, at the church around the world, he is the groom who in that moment he's seeing his bride as if for the first time. Again, Isaiah says in Isaiah 62, as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. This is how God feels about you. This isn't how Jesus just sees us in the future. It's how he sees you now. Our future is certain because we have been clothed by Jesus' righteousness and he rejoices over us you. So Jesus has given us his righteousness, but that's actually not the only righteousness mentioned here. Verse 8 goes on to say, fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Once we've been saved and made holy and righteous, God has a mission for his bride, for us, to do the righteous acts, the good works that he has prepared for us. These acts don't determine our beauty in God's eyes, but he is not indifferent to them. He loves them. The church is the only hope for the world, the only hope for Brighton, and it can be radiant. It's been so great to hear how Holler Road, through the Practicals team, has been joining together with other churches around Brighton to help those who have fallen on hard times. And that's just one small example. But Jesus loves it when his bride stands up for truth and goodness and justice. He thinks we are beautiful. So what are the righteous acts that God has asked you to put on? Where has he called you to shine brightly this week? Not to determine your beauty, but to live it out. Where can you shine beautifully? So finally, we come to the guests. In this imagery in Revelation, the church is not only the bride, but also the guests who are invited. No wedding would be complete without witnesses, and here in Revelation, there are a fair few of them. I'm sure, uh, like uh, me, many of us have been watching the Tokyo Olympic Games over the last few weeks. Uh, I love just sitting down uh, and watching the highlights of everything that had happened. And I don't normally do this, but this year I ended up watching a bit of the closing ceremony. 
And it was actually a really beautiful event, lots of uh, lights and special effects and, and fireworks. But for me, better than all of that was when the athletes came into the stadium and were just celebrating being there. There was a sense of joy as these athletes from around the world came together and were united even just for a moment by something bigger than themselves. And it reminded me of this picture we have here in Revelation. A far greater number will gather before the throne of God and it will be a celebration like no other. There will be people from every country in the world, each with their own language, culture, skills, talents, and yet they will cry out in unison the words of verse 6 and 7. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like the loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. It's such an amazing image that the angel has to reiterate to John, these are the true words of God. This is going to happen. And John is so overwhelmed by this incredible vision he sees, he falls down and worships the angel who is showing him this vision. And the angel's like, what are you doing? Worship God. Don't worship me. I am a fellow servant. As John looks on at this wedding in the future, his job is the same as the very angels showing him this vision. And it's the same as ours. So what is the job of the angels? Well, they were messengers of God. As the, as the last verse testifies, as the last verse says, they testified all about Jesus. And the angel tells John, that is your job too. In the midst of an ever-changing world, we get to invite people to a sure and certain future. We too become messengers like the angels of the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ died and rose again to forgive sinners and live with them for all eternity. The future is uncertain. We can't tell people what's ahead for them. We can't even say what's going to happen tomorrow. But we can, with absolute certainty, invite people to this wedding feast of the Lamb. I'm just going to invite the band to come up, but I just want to finish with a question. Early, uh, we filled in these little invitation cards, so I wanted to ask, have you accepted this wedding invitation from Jesus to be his bride? Is your name at the wedding feast because Jesus wants you there? He wants to capture your heart and delight it. And if you, if you have accepted that invitation, who can you invite? Who is your plus one? But actually, there's no limit to the people you could invite. Who's your plus two? Who's your plus 100? Who can you invite to this amazing wedding with our beloved Jesus? Because his arms are open wide. I'm just going to pray as we continue in worship. Father, I thank you that you have invited us to this amazing wedding at the end of time. I thank you that invitation goes out to each and every person who hear my words, is hearing my words today. I thank you that this invitation is free and it's been bought by the sacrifice of the Lamb. Lord God, I thank you for your righteousness. I thank you that you see us as radiant. Help us to be radiant as we reach out to those around us. Lord God, help us to sacrifice. And Father, help us to be radiant brides who are inviting people to the wedding with our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to worship you as we come before you now. Amen.